welcome to another amazing episode of Say It Online, where we help digital agency owners stop just randomly shouting into the void and start communicating meaningfully and effectively in this digital age. I'm your host, Say Gabriel, and this episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Nancy Content. If you're sick of conversion content being a huge pain in your agency's butt, especially websites, campaigns, etc., let's talk. With the smoothest content process ever, a team of unbelievably skilled and organized content strategists and years of subcontracting experience, Anansi is looking to make your life as a digital agency owner unbelievably easier. Just head, if you're interested, to anansicontent.com, that's A-N-A-N-S-I content.com and hit Let's Talk. And now, without further ado, here's our episode. Hey, digital agency owners, welcome to another awesome episode of Say It Online, where we help you communicate effectively in the digital age and all of the magical stuff that comes along with that. My name's Say Gabriel, and I am the founder and chief at Anansi Content. I am super, super stoked today to talk and interview actually one of my favorite people in the world. We have been friends for, uh, I think, a solid decade at this point. And she is also my right hand here at Anansi, our chief of operations, and pretty much the boss of everything, including me. Um, Let's welcome (laughs) Celine Hogue to the podcast. Welcome, Celine. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Well, I have many questions to pepper you with today, both about your role and otherwise. But before we do that, why don't you take a few minutes to tell us about yourself and your personal life, so your non-Anansi life, and then as well, (laughs) uh, share a little bit about what you do with me at Anansi here in the business. Okay. Um, Well, I guess I'll start with kind of my background and how I started working with you, because I think that kind of gives the context on my personal life. Um, But originally, I was in commercial real estate appraisal. So that kind of ranges everywhere from warehouse buildings to townhouse developments to expropriation for hydro lines. Totally, totally, totally different than this industry. But what happened is, well, like happens to many women of my age, I got pregnant and I had a kid and I was on mat leave. And then, you know, we obviously were friends. We started talking and you needed someone uh, to help do admin for just a couple hours a week. Needless to say, that snowballed into me doing more and more and more and taking on all the things that I love and you hate, like numbers and super nerd stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, and um, and then especially as my daughter got older, now I'm able to take a lot more of an active role in Nancy, and I'm the chief of operations, so I basically boss you around, I boss everyone around, I coordinate everything, I plan everything, I do the numbers, especially the numbers. I love math and processes and anything in a spreadsheet. And that's pretty much it. (laughs) Well, Celine, I think you are being super modest in terms of even how you came to a Nancy. Just listeners, just to like set the record straight. So she had already been kind of helping me on the side, correcting different assistant work, helping me screen people, just like as a friend on Facebook for years. And uh, she actually helped me screen an admin assistant type role. And she was like, you know what? I wouldn't mind applying for this. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not sure. Went through a few different people and lo and behold, I just needed somebody last minute. And Celine worked for me for one day, less than 24 hours. And I was like, oh my God, I need to woo you away from your job. I, I don't, when you go back to Matt leave, I do not want you to go back to your other job. I want you to work for me and not as an admin assistant. I need you to be on my leadership team and like be by my side <laughs> straight up like 24 hours. I was like, I knew. And uh, I, uh, it took me a, a long time to work up the courage to kind of put forward that plan. And it took even longer, although doesn't feel like that long at all to come to where we are today, where you have pretty much become my boss. But anyway, you don't give yourself enough credit. Just say that. (laughs) It's been almost two years since we've been working together now. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And exciting. Yeah. Also crazy to think (laughs) that we have grown from, uh, you know, pretty much a two person operation into a stable team of seven. Uh, That's in two years. Yeah. That's, that's pretty impressive. That's super exciting. Anyway, uh, leading us back, I'm sure we could uh, continue chatting all day. And I'm 
really excited to spend the next hour chatting, but uh, what were some of the issues? So transitioning from real estate to content strategy, right? Like obviously there was some overlap there because you had the skills and they shone through right away, but how was that for you? Were there any like uh, communication kind of issues or differences that you came up against during that transition? I think for me, one habit that was really hard to break was tone coming from a background where I might be writing reports that are going to, you know, the Supreme court and there's a whole bunch of judges reading it and people's fortunes being determined by it is it's very, very, very formal and stick to the facts, stick to the facts, stick to the facts. When you go into content and you're engaging with an audience, it's the exact opposite. Yes, you want to connect with them on a logical level and be concise and clear, but you want to engage them. You want to connect with them on that emotional level, which is something that I was totally out of my comfort zone, but also really fun and exciting to do. Yeah, absolutely. And this is actually something I've seen um, because we have screened a lot, (laughs) a lot of writers over the years (laughs) here at Anansi. And I've noticed that people who come from more of a formal background, that's a really difficult habit to break. Whereas uh, quite often, interestingly enough, although you might think that uh, something like copywriting which does have, you know, like best practices and structures and et cetera. Well, you might think that that would be more aligned with formal writing. uh, And that's how most people tend to approach it. It's actually way more aligned with narrative in my experience. And people who come from a narrative background who are used to telling a story can often grasp that, uh, I guess, that uh, shift in tone that's necessary a little bit easier. It can be intimidating, though, taking liberties and using a more fun or informal tone, especially because I think a lot of times people worry they're going to alienate certain audiences if they, for example, use cussing or if they use certain jargon that appeals to a very specific generation or group. When in reality, if you want to connect to your ideal audience, the more specific your audience is and the more specifically you can speak their language and show that you understand them, then the more the audience that you're looking for is going to connect. And even though, even if you do know that on a logical level, it's really hard to break that habit and to kind of go for it and use fun language as opposed to just being kind of that reserved standard like 90s website, like so-and-so started working in 2001. They are, they've been business, they are located and, you know, just kind of sticking to the facts that are really dry and boring that you see a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I think that there is kind of a time and place for using more formal language. But what I'm hearing from you, Celine, is that being willing to kind of step outside of that comfort zone and being willing to talk kind of in the way that your audience will kind of get and relate to can be super valuable because it also sets you apart. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Yeah, totally. And even with the more formal tones, using that more specific language that appeals to a certain group or demographic that is your audience, as opposed to being formal and just also being very bland and being very generic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what are some things that helped you kind of get out of the habit of being formal and uh, help you kind of figure out what language your audience was looking for and transition into that? You nagged me incessantly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the truth comes up and it hurts. <laughs> it's like anything. If it's hard to necessarily notice it when you're doing it in a minute, but if you, I mean, even if you aren't lucky enough to have a say by your side who's constantly picking it out, if you go through with a critical eye on everything you write and say, "Is this generic? Is this too dry?" you know, like after you've written everything, you sit down and specifically look for those things, then they start jumping out at you, but you have to do it mindfully. You can't just kind of write and then submit it. And because then all these things kind of start to pop back in and you don't realize it, even if you know that you should be doing it, it's hard to catch it in the moment. Mm. So what I'm hearing is that uh, it's one of those things that does become more, uh, sorry, easier, not more challenging over time. But at first, you kind of have to Uh, Or am I hearing that you're saying that you should kind of write it first and then go back and identify the formalness or that you have to kind of figure out ways to do it as you go? No, I would say, you know, like do it first, just write whatever you're going to write and then go through it afterward with an eye for those things. 
And in fact, one thing that I, you know, now I'm thinking about that I remember that really helped me was that content rubric that we put together that has specifically the checklist that you can look for those things. Ah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, like obviously I don't do a lot of content writing anymore, but I remember, you know, sometimes writing something and then going through it afterward with the checklist and be like, oh, you know, I probably didn't include enough CTAs on that page. Or, oh, I realized I didn't include any proof points or any statistics. Because there's, you know, when you're writing, you'd always think to include it. But if you have the checklist afterward, then it's hard to forget to do it because you have to look for it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, And that's a good plug for our checklist as well. We will include that (laughs) in the show notes, listeners. (laughs) No, but we actually, uh, the idea of a rubric is one that we, of course, lovers of organization and uh, templates as well. The rubric is something that, is, was one of our earliest things that we implemented as copywriters as at Anansi. And it's one of those things that has evolved quite a bit and has actually led to a few different simpler models and, uh, I guess, approaches to strategy and content that, as far as we know, are relatively unique that came out of just a simple checklist. You know, and I think that this is something that can be applied for a lot of different types of writing. Uh, you know, uh, the internet, as well as these types of podcasts, as well as some awesome books can give you the criteria that you want to put on it. But what would you say? Actually, that's, that's a great question for you, Celine. What would you say in attempting to write conversion content yourself? And I think that we'll, we'll also talk about your uh, kind of role and insights within the business managing people. But uh, in terms of learning to write conversion content, uh, what would you say the most important characteristic or the, you know, the kind of easiest to forget perhaps, but like the most important element of conversion copy is for you? I think there are two, and these are things that you drilled into my head over and over and over, so I'll never forget them. But they're also the two things that I, when I was reviewing drafts, when we used to use outsourced copywriters, that would be missing the most um, is two, or sorry, one is showing benefits over features, not just talking about what a company does or what a product is, but how that benefits the person using them. What's the transformation? Um, So benefits as opposed to just features. And the other one is showing, not telling, you know, not saying we always do it right the first time, but using it like, for example, more specific language that shows an instance of when you took the longer way to do it better as opposed to just saying it. So yeah, showing, not telling and benefits, not features are the two biggest things that are always missing that are hard to look for when you're skimming it yourself too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I could tell I I did drill this into your head. Um, Because I remember that it took us months, actually, even, I think, for you to fully wrap your mind around what showing not telling means. And just in case some of our readers don't fully understand that whole concept of showing not telling, can you give us another example or kind of explain it in like a different way? Well, I guess, even just a basic kind of level would be instead of just saying, you know, we're award winning, is saying, maybe having a case study of what you created that won the award. It's not just saying something expecting people to take it at face value, but providing evidence for it. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, that's a really great succinct way to put it. And that actually is another narrative concept. Uh, (laughs) Anyone who's ever been (laughs) in a creative writing class uh, has heard show, don't tell countless times, or at least I have heard it in the creative writing classes. I have been countless times. And uh, I think this kind of attaches to this idea of generic language as well. Anyone who's ever worked with me on anything copy related knows that I have a very deep and fervent discomfort with generic (laughs) language in anything that is going out. And uh, the reason for this is that there are phrases that feel good because they feel familiar. And some of these phrases these uh, that you're giving, Celine, I think are good examples, uh, like award winning or uh, exceeds customer expectations or things like that. Things that we hear a lot, which are comforting to us as writers and as readers, but they're almost so comforting to us that we skim right on past them. They don't, and they don't really mean anything. Exactly. Exactly. They don't really mean anything. Um, And so what I'm hearing from you is that uh, by getting a lot more specific about 
what we're trying to say by using these more generic common terms, we can actually both set ourselves apart and engage the reader on a deeper level. Yeah, and the, and it's more believable. It builds the automatic authority. Um, back to kind of a case study example. So instead of just saying, you know, we're award winning, again, they'll probably just give it be like, blah, blah, blah. What if it's just some award that they're like mom cut of cardboard or something? You don't know what the award is. But if you provide the full story, you show the before and after pictures, you kind of give them that whole it package of you paint the picture, then the reader will be like, wow, look what they did for them. They can do that for me too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree. And uh, as I should, being the person who taught you. (laughs) But uh, I'd love to kind of change our directions a little bit here, Celine, and uh, just talk about, you know, your journey through Anansi, which, you know, in some ways, this time has passed so quickly. In another, in other ways, so much has happened over the past two years. Even I got a shock when you said that because it feels like it's been so much longer. But you actually went through the type of transition that is kind of renowned within the entrepreneurial world. In that, although you're not technically an entrepreneur, but you are, you are essentially, you know, you're running this business with your, mm-hmm. you're on the leadership team. But you started out in a production style role. So you started out, you know, actually putting putting together content strategies, writing, all of those kinds of things. And then you actually moved to more of a managerial role. And uh, I know for a lot of people, kind of depending what your background or desire is, I'm somebody who loves the creative work and the managerial stuff, but ultimately I thrive off of leading teams. And I know that you do as well, Uh, but still a little bit of a shock to go from interacting, you know, mostly on the back end to being responsible for essentially directing a whole bunch of people. (laughs) So I'm curious, how did the way that you approached work and also uh, of course we're always looking at it through the lens of communication uh, how did that shift with that transition what was it easy was it difficult what are some things that helped you through it I think it was easy because even though I am now amazing at strategy and writing thanks to going through this process and doing it what I am really 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 good at and passionate about and which is ultimately why I'm in this role now is logistics and organization and overseeing things and yeah, when you're, you know, kind of a one or two person team, you have to be doing the production yourself because who else is going to do it? You're a one or two person team. But then when you start to scale, it becomes a lot easier to separate kind of working on your business versus working in your business, because now we have other people that fulfill the day to day projects and you and I and our chief of admin, we can focus solely on making the company better, making sure that our products are better, that our services are better, that Basically, that everything we're just constantly improving as opposed to being kind of stuck in the trenches, just always doing and maybe trying to cram in some sales on the side so we can keep going, but never really having that extra leeway to work on improvements, which is what you and I both love, like far and away the most um, is what we're most passionate about. Absolutely. And how has your role, so currently you are chief of operations, how has that role changed over the time that you've been kind of in a more managerial role? Um, Well, I think it's the same thing too, as we start to scale. Originally, when I started doing that, that was essentially basically doing everything that I'm doing now in terms of logistics and overseeing, but also I was doing all the admin as well. Or not all the admin, because we had a VA, but generally like a large share of kind of the higher level admin stuff. And now that we have an amazing, awesome chief of admin who's able to take on more and more of those responsibilities, I'm able to kind of step back and organize things at a higher level, focus more on our finances, our planning, projections, that kind of thing. And also now that we're a larger team, there's more management that's kind of required on that higher level too with more people to take care of. Absolutely. And uh, moving from a small team to, you know, what is still considered to be a relatively small team, but still two people and seven people, that's a big jump. What sorts of uh, kind of challenges or unexpected things did you come up against now directing a team of, you know, for j- just for a little bit of context, uh, listeners, so you guys know what our team looks like. Uh, we have four strategists, a chief of admin, uh, and then Celine, chief of ops, and myself, uh, who is a marketing and CEO role. So managing, you know, for, from doing the production yourself to managing for strategists, like what were some of the kind of challenges you came up against, you come up against? 
in that. Uh, well, one of the biggest things I think is not necessarily knowing what's going on with projects at a granular level. When you're a team of two, you're doing all the projects yourself. You know front to back what, what all of them are, where they're at, all that kind of stuff. And then when you have a team of seven, obviously I don't know what every single person is doing on a day-to-day basis. And thankfully our strategists are super amazing and organized and they keep projects on track. Um, and also, you know, we have weekly meetings where we go through all the projects and get the headlines. But sometimes someone, you know, a partner will come to me and ask about some like detailed part of a project. And I mean, in my head, I kind of shrug. That's not what I do out loud. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, trying to make sure that everyone is organized and even and it's OK that you don't know what every single little piece of what's going on at every single level, as long as you have a team that you can trust that, you know, they're doing their job. Mm. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing is that as you have uh, started managing more people and there's been more projects kind of on the go, uh, you found it just kind of impossible to know exactly what's happening day to day. And sometimes that uh, maybe throws you for a loop a little bit, especially since as the person in authority, people are coming to you with questions and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing some of the ways that you've kind of mitigated that or eased that transition include like a weekly meeting and kind of having strategists responsible for their own deadlines to some degree. Did you want to expand on that a bit? Yeah, that's exactly what we do. We also in our L10 agenda, we have a chart with each strategist and all their current projects, all their upcoming meetings, where the project, the project status is. So even if I'm not 100% sure on where something's at, I can always check that list. Obviously, I can go to the strategist as well. We all have really good open communication. And I think this kind of thing doesn't work where I don't micromanage people. They manage themselves really well. That doesn't happen without an absolutely amazing team. Uh, I mean, like if we had someone that didn't manage their deadlines or that we couldn't trust, then I would have to spend that extra effort constantly micromanaging them. And that would suck. So uh, long story short, TLDR, I love our team so much. There. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I feel very, very much the same way. And uh, this is something actually that comes up and I hear it a lot from digital agency owners. And certainly we've had our ups and downs with it, which is around the team, right? Like around the how to find, identify, nurture and keep those amazing people. But uh, I, I would say probably one of the questions and issues I hear the most is kind of how to screen for the right people, like how to know that you're actually hiring that rock star and not that lemon. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that has kind of changed or that you've learned over this journey that you think would be valuable to share with our listeners? Yeah. So I'm going to shamelessly plug an app we use called Vervo, which essentially (laughs) lets you do an online interview process where you can ask a bunch of questions to people and Every applicant has to fill it out. Then you can score them on a scale. It's technically one to 10. You get to score them on like happy face to dead face. And there's like a sad face in between. But which is anyway, that's uh, that's awesome. But the, the point is, is you're able to ask better questions because you can ask people to sh- you can ask showing, not telling questions. If you're in an interview, it's when you ask questions on the spot, it's very they're mostly kind of things where people tell you. But if you ask them, for example, you know, like write a great header, subheader, and content for a hero for this fake website, then they're showing you whether or not they can write. You're not just asking them to tell you whether or not they can write a website. Okay, yeah, and uh, I too love Vervo. Um, but uh, I do want to, I know it's so easy to kind of go after the shiny object thing. So I want to kind of tie this into the kind of process that goes along with it and kind of how we as people respond to it. Uh, so when you say that you're giving assessments to particular candidates, I, I assume when you say you're asking them questions, you know, you're giving them assessments of some kind. So you've mentioned mm-hmm. some of them are kind of skill testing and specific are all the questions like that? Do you kind of mix the questions all together? Like what does that process of screening look like? Well, we have two levels. So the first level is primarily skill testing. It's, you know, can you reach like the most bare criteria to even work for us? And there are a couple of questions that kind of touch on values, but the first stage is just, do you even have the skills whatsoever? Um, And then if they make it to the second phase, the second phase is a lot more about culture and logistics. So do they share our values as a company, which is really important because if they don't share your values, they're not going to be working towards the same goal as you. And then it's talking about things like logistics. Do they work in a time zone that works with you or 
or do they have the capacity to work the number of hours that you need them to? Or sometimes, you know, if we're hiring for a part-time position, maybe they're looking for full-time, they wouldn't be satisfied. They'd leave after six months when they find a full-time position. So, you know, there's kind of three levels. There's the skills, there's the value and culture, and there's the logistics that you need to assess for. Okay. And uh, does this kind of take the place, uh, does this kind of replace the typical resume and like interview process or is it on top of that or what does that look like? So I would say that I generally don't look too much at resumes. We, I mean, some of the questions have asked for information that's typically on a resume, like what is your experience and background? But generally, the, um, and in Verbo, what we use, they have the option of filling out the profile. And if they fill out more information, that means they're probably more dedicated to getting the job. I give it a, probably a lot more thorough look and I have more background for them, which is great. And then we do we do the uh, in-person interview where we get to know them. Because sometimes someone, a mindless person on a screen can look great until you talk to them. And then suddenly in the interview, they're argumentative with you. Or they actually, turns out they don't really speak English or whatever it is that you can realize right away they're not a good fit. And then our kind of final step is we do a test project and we pay it because they've already spent all this time doing all all these steps to get to us. So usually we hand them a paid test project, which is kind of just the final step of, can they even do the work? Are they actually not only able to do the work, but can they do it well? And can they ask questions while they're doing it? I think for our admin position, we specifically were kind of vague on one part of the instructions to see if applicants would ask us for, for clarification to show that they're, good at communicating and not afraid to speak up. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, this is something I've heard a lot of uh, companies talk about. I know that we've leveraged quite a bit in different areas is that idea of uh, kind of almost a trick question, like just asking something, you know, just leaving room for them to either show you that they read the instructions clearly or show you that they have the kind of critical thinking to uh, kind of challenge something or ask for more information. So that's been super valuable. Um, So what I'm hearing from you is that essentially less emphasis on resumes, but you do give them some kind of uh, more background oriented questions. Uh, You still do an interview, but it sounds like you're doing fewer interviews because the interviewees are people who have already kind of made it through the first few stages. And uh, I'm curious, how long does this process usually take? I mean, this is sounding quite involved. Is this, you know, uh, a process that takes like days, weeks, months? Um, usually it takes a couple weeks because the first week you get a whole bunch of applicants. Usually everyone applies right up front when the uh, job posting is take uh, is posted. And then the second phase, if there's two phases of an interview, the second phase or of the online interview takes another week or so. And then there's maybe another week for the hiring and test project. So I would say at like the very outside is about a month. But I mean, it can be quicker because sometimes the day you fill it out or you post it online, people fill out the form, you advance them, they fill out the next phase, the second day, and they're on to their interview by the end of the week. So, I mean, and then you know those people are really motivated and dedicated too, so that's good. Yeah. And it depends on the time of year. Like, we tried hiring over Christmas, and that was a bit slower. But, because, you know, people are busy and doing stuff with their families. Yeah, absolutely. Which just goes to show, which is something I've heard a lot, like keep applying for jobs over Christmas because it just <laughs> means there's less competition. <laughs> yeah. Um, at, when I was at my old job, I did hiring for admin position and it was through resumes. And I have to say, like most resumes, they all kind of look the same. And it's really, really hard to get a good feel for how good of an employee someone is based on the resume. Because even if they've been around for two decades and have all the experience in the world, they can still suck. They can still not have, or they might even be a good employee, but just a bad fit for your company. And it's really, really hard to tell with the resume because they don't, they just kind of provide a list of what they've done, not necessarily how they've succeeded in their roles. Yes. Yes. A hundred times. Yes. I uh, have horror of going through (laughs) resumes. Um, And uh, actually before I uh, started a Nancy and actually while I was getting a Nancy going, I did a lot of resumes professionally for people. People hired me to do their resumes in a lot of ways. It is when properly done uh, like copywriting or like a narrative, but uh it honestly, it doesn't take much to, to make your resume stand out, but it takes a lot 
to make your resume reflect you as a person. But at yeah. best, we would say it's a way to get the interview, right? And then, as you said, like there's so much pressure on that interview to uh, make a good impression. It may not be properly reflective of the long term, long term, long term success, <laughs> the long term success of that person. Mm-hmm. And the other thing to consider is that in a resume, it's so easy to send, you might get 500 resumes, and it's hard to go through them all when there's that kind of extra step of filling out a form, it kind of weeds out all the people who immediately go to it and be like, Oh, I'm not qualified for this at all. I don't know the answer to the first question. Um, in fact, I think we've had two people before that like specifically said, I have no experience in this and kind of filled out all the answers like that. Um, but in general, anyone who's not qualified at all for the position just won't apply. Yeah, that's very true. Or they'll get, uh, and I remember we've experienced this once or twice, they'll get extremely frustrated at the process. And uh, even in one case, we had somebody leave us a really bad review on Google because they applied for the copywriter position and either perhaps struggled to get through it or uh, felt upset that they didn't advance or something like that. And, uh, you know, in that context, It's not that we're trying to like pressure people to do something that's super difficult. It's that for the right person, the process is not super difficult. I mean, it might be involved, but typically it's confirming for them that this is something that they enjoy doing. Hopefully. I mean, we want to hire people who enjoy doing. And actually (laughs) at least three of the people we hired specifically expressed that they actually loved doing the application and had a lot of fun doing it, which shows that they're the right person for the role because the sort of questions that they're answering is the type of work that they would be doing for us. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so let me ask, and uh, I may already know the answer to this question. (laughs) When you started implementing this form process, and and just to kind of break down, so what I'm hearing is kind of the simplified process. Yes, you can use Verbo, the tool, but if you wanted to do this yourself, you would essentially post a job, but send them to a form instead of inviting them to fill out a resume. And then essentially based on the people who, you know, the form maybe would be an evaluation of some kind, or you would grade the answers. And then based on those answers, you would send the people who passed kind of a second level. And then based on the people who did well on that, you would give them an interview. Is that kind of what I'm, and then test project. Is that sum it up? Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. So once you implemented that process, Did things just magically go well for hiring the right person? Or how did that process uh, evolve over time, if not? So I think for our process for hiring strategists, we kind of got lucky that we already had really good questions. But I'll I'll talk a little bit more about our process for the admin, because that's kind of where we refined our our questions a lot more. I'm just just going to interrupt you also. I don't think we got... I, okay, maybe luck had something to do with it, but maybe the fact that content strategy is like what we do as a okay, well, to <laughs> not, not, Okay, we didn't get lucky. We did a really great job. But the point <laughs> is we didn't, we didn't really have any like issues or things that needed to be refined on that Compar- end. I mean, compared uh, to admin, right? Like ad- yeah. admin is just, uh, even though we both come from admin backgrounds, uh, hiring someone to do it for you in your content strategy business when you're used to doing it yourself is different. <laughs> yeah, but we started to realize or we realized later on that maybe some of the questions we were asking weren't the most important questions for what we were looking for or didn't most accurately, I guess, filter out the people with the right values and mindset and work ethic. So we were able, you know, it's, it's trial and error. You don't want to hire three admin people in a year. But by the time you're on your third round, you know 100% that you're asking the right questions because after somebody doesn't work out, you sit down and think critically, like, how could we have screened better to find an applicant that was more suited for us? Like, which questions weren't right? Or how maybe how we interpreted questions we could have interpreted better. What do you mean by that? Like, when you say interpreted, specifically when you say the way we interpreted questions or responses to questions, we could have interpreted them better. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on uh, how your interpretation of answers improved or how you kind of were able to zero in on what made somebody a bad fit and how that related to the questions you're asking? Yeah. So one example, I mean, I don't remember the very specific question off the top of my head, but it can be really attractive to hire someone who's a go-getter, who says they like to work long hours and are always on and are really passionate about what they do 
When in reality, when they start working for you, you might realize they're a workaholic who has 10 side projects because they can't focus on a single thing. So you might go for someone who has an answer that's more centered around stability and doing things right and focusing on a single thing. Or, you know, and we've specifically started looking for people who talked more about work-life balance and mental wellness in our last round because we realized that we don't want to attract the type of person who works 60, 70 hours a week between three jobs. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, what I'm hearing is that from a value, because there's two sides to this, right? Mm -hmm. The kind of skills perspective and the values perspective. And I'm hearing that the values perspective was really critical and understanding how to kind of read people's responses and decide whether or not they were aligned with kind of the values that we had established as a company. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Yeah, absolutely. And as you know, we sat down at our quarterly planning and even critically looked at our values and made sure that what we were looking, you know, that our values accurately reflected us and then what we were looking for accurately aligned with our values. Yeah, yeah. And actually that uh, I remember was kind of an aha moment for me because we'd been told, you know, your business values are super important and you should, you know, hire for culture and all this different type of stuff. But I don't think I ever fully considered our values as a hiring tool until that moment. And uh, not just a hiring tool, but a gauge, using the people on our team as a gauge for our values themselves as well. Like as you were kind of bringing up the wellness example, I know we used to have a work-life balance uh, more as one of our values. Uh, And we realized, as you said, that although we didn't want to attract the crazy workaholics, you know, not everyone, the people that we were hiring tended to naturally kind of have challenges with that. Uh, And we kind of adjusted that value to mean radical wellness instead, because we're intense. (laughs) We work hard and we play hard. We do. And so that's a little bit more, but also work hard, play hard wasn't quite what we were looking for. Yeah, of course. Uh, Yeah. Uh, well, of course, see, of course, to us, but to someone else, yeah. it might be, well, isn't that kind of the same thing? <laughs> anyway, we, that's a whole other podcast episode. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. And I know we could just, yeah, there's lots of different directions we can go in with this as well. I, I'd also love you to just uh, share a little bit around that, because I think VAs and admin support are something I also hear a lot from our listeners, what were some of the things other than hiring the right person um, and having the right process in place to hire that person? What are some of the things that you've either learned or reinforced for yourself about making that admin's relationship successful, particularly around communication? Yeah, so it really, I guess there's two main kinds of admin position that people hire for. Um, especially when it's a VA is there's the first type, which is basically you're kind of doing the same repetitive work over and over, whether it be data entry or IT support, or, you know, you need one person who just does one single role and they don't need to think critically too much. Or if they do, it's just surrounding this one little area versus we are hiring or we hired a VA that was more kind of not leadership, but someone who works a lot more independently to oversee different areas, to think critically Um, and see room for improvement. So it's really important to be able to find that kind of person who works at that high level, who is going to take that freedom and not use it as an excuse to kind of slack off, but as an excuse to step up in every area of the company and make their mark and make sure that everything is being run really well. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm hearing understanding what you're looking for in the role, uh, because VA is kind of a wide term, understanding whether you're looking for someone to be the hands or someone who can kind of take a higher level of accountability. Is that, uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Anything else in terms of like how you communicate or how you approach things with someone in an admin role at either level that has contributed to its success for you? Yeah. Well, I think really just having an awesome admin person and holding them accountable to communicating to us, because when you have an admin person, if you're constantly checking whether their tasks are done and micromanaging them, it kind of defeats the purpose of having someone doing all these tasks for you because that takes too long. So first of all, you need to have someone that you trust to get things done and have a process so that they can keep track of what tasks are working on and check back in with you and make sure that they always have a way of getting hold of you, whether it be a way to book meetings with you. We have a weekly admin L10 meeting specifically for all the admin issues. 
or you know being available on Slack, it's important to make sure that that communication goes two ways. Because I think, especially when you hire a VA overseas, is a lot of VAs are kind of trained to be quiet in the background and not ask questions. Or if they're not trained to do it, that's just kind of their natural tendency. So whether or not you have someone whose tendency is to naturally ask questions is to make sure that you're always inviting them to ask questions and keep that communication open. Mm, That's great advice. Uh, Really understanding that they might have a different understanding of when is appropriate to communicate and just nurturing that uh, dynamic of open communication, giving them kind of the channels, the access, but also the reinforcement to communicate with you as needed. Mm -hmm. That is Awesome. All right. Well, this has been super, super excellent talking to you, Celine. I, I mean, I get to talk to you multiple, <laughs> multiple times a week. Um, so this is uh, nothing strange. But uh, it uh, has been really great for you to share some of your experiences and expertise with our listeners. Why don't you uh, just wind us down by telling the audience how they can get in contact with you if they want to talk to you more specifically about anything. Celine, by the way, is also a great person to talk to if you are curious around scheduling or logistics for a project since she manages everyone's schedules. But what's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, Celine, C-E-L-E-N-E at anansicontent.com. A-N-A-N-S-I-C-O-N-T-E-N-T dot com. And seriously, feel free to hit me up about anything, even if it's not content related. If you have hiring questions, if you want to see our sample interview questions, I absolutely love talking about strategy and hiring and processes and all the stuff that's the, that I do every day, but isn't really the face of our company. I love talking about that. So feel free to hit me up for that. Or if you want to talk about a new project or strategy or really anything. I'm here. Yeah, Celine is also the process queen. We all love processes pretty hard. But uh, yeah, all that stuff. Uh, I know there's another podcast out there that calls it the unsexy side. (laughs) (laughs) But I also find it super fun and awesome. And uh, which is probably why we make a good team together. All right, Celine, thank you so, 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 so much. This has been an absolute pleasure uh, to all of our listeners. As usual, in the show notes, we will have for you all of the various things we've referenced here, uh, both tools and Celine's contact information. By all means, go and check that out, as well as past episodes on at our website, www.anansycontent.com. I also encourage you, wherever you are listening to this podcast, whether it is iTunes or Google Play or one of the many podcast platforms out there, please give us a thumbs up, uh, follow us, give us a positive review. All this stuff makes such a big difference for us to be able to bring this value to more people, more digital agency owners like you. Um, All of that being said, this is the end of another awesome episode of Say It Online, helping you guys communicate with clarity and confidence in the digital age. And I hope you have an excellent rest of your day. And that does it for another amazing episode of the Say It Online podcast. Join us next week. And don't forget to like and subscribe, whether it's iTunes, whatever your favorite podcast player is. It is always, always appreciated. It really makes a difference for us. It helps us get this word out to more people. As always, this episode was brought to you by our sponsor and Say's own business, Anansi Content. If you're a digital agency owner and you're still wasting too much time chasing down content that maybe isn't even all that great, let's talk. We've spent years working on the best process for selling, planning, and delivering amazing conversion content for your client projects. Better yet, we moosh our process to yours that your client and you have a seamless and amazing experience the entire time through. If you're interested, just go to our website. That's www.anansicontent.com. That's A-N-A-N-S-I content.com. And just click Let's Talk. I'd love to chat with you. Someone else on the team would also love to chat with you too. Hope you have an amazing rest of your day.